Good morning, everyone. Welcome today to today's Exploring by the CDR Pants Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Gorowski. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Exploring by the CDR Pants is all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation into classrooms across North America and hopefully beyond. Um, I'll be your host for today, but I'll be the speaker as well. I just returned from an awesome 10-day trip to the Galapagos Islands with uh, National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions um, as part of a program called the Grosvenor Teacher Fellowship. So every year, National Geographic uh, selects a handful of teachers who are uh, going above and beyond to try and open their classrooms up to the world. So through geoliteracy, uh, through science, uh, this year they picked 30 teachers from around North America, four from Canada, which was pretty cool. Um, we went to Washington for four days. We got to meet all the other teachers. Uh, we had workshops to help us prepare for our trip. We learned from photographers. Uh, we learned about different ways we could bring geography and science into our classrooms. And then they started sending us off into the world. So some teachers have already been to the British Isles. Uh, some teachers have been to the Arctic, so Svalbard, uh, Greenland, and Iceland. Um, a handful of teachers got to go to the Galapagos. And then a few more will be going to Antarctica uh, over the next few months, all the way up until January. So for me, as a science teacher, um, there was nowhere in the world I wanted to go other than the Galapagos. So for them to pick me for the fellowship and then send me to the Galapagos, it was a dream come true. And I'm going to take you guys to the Galapagos. I'm going to show you some of the pictures, some of the animals, some of the landscapes, and talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the Galapagos, the good and the bad. So uh, we're going to take a moment. I'm going to share my screen. So you're going to see things change a little bit. start the screen share you should see my screen now and right now you should be looking at a map of South America okay so if for some reason a class can't see this uh, just turn your microphone and microphone on and let me know but it should be working uh, now so oops there we go so we flew um, myself from Canada just outside of Toronto uh, to Miami and then from Miami we flew to South America so you can see here, this is South America. Ecuador is the country we flew to right here. We flew to Guayaquil. And then from there, we flew to the Galapagos. It was only about an hour flight. You can see it's a tiny group of volcanic islands, uh, about 1,000 kilometers from Ecuador. A little bit closer, this is the group of islands. There are a little group of volcano islands, or volcanic islands, like I mentioned. Um, they formed over a hot spot in the Pacific Ocean. So the hot spot's actually over here in the uh, west. So these are the younger islands that are still very volcanically active. And then as the hot spot, the islands moved uh, from the hot spot, they get older and the volcanoes go dormant. So here are the two older islands, San Cristobal and Espanola, they're in the east. And actually, if you could follow uh, the path to the shore, you would see old islands from the Galapagos that have weathered away and are now below the surface. So that could be the fate of some of these islands in thousands of years from now is to weather away and disappear below the surface. So we landed here on Baltra. It's also called South Seymour. And we got on board the National Geographic Endeavor. I'll show you guys a picture in a second. Um, we spent some time uh, on Santa Cruz right here. And then we spent a little bit of time up there. We took the boat to Rabida and spent some time there, as well as North Seymour. We then went all the way around Isabella, which is a seahorse-shaped island, to Fernandina. This is the youngest island in the Galapagos. And then we spent a good part of a day here. And then we made our way along this part of Isabella and visited a few spots. So Isabella is actually a collection of six volcanoes that formed together to form the largest island in the Galapagos. From there, we went to Santiago. We then spent some time again on Santa Cruz. And our last day we spent on San Cristobal before we flew back to Guayaquil in Ecuador. So I promised to show you the ship. This is the National Geographic Endeavor. It holds 90 people, um, so it's not very crowded. Um, and along the back, you can't see in this picture, you can see some of the zodiacs down here. There's about nine zodiacs. And those zodiacs 
Uh, we would hop in them sometimes two or three times a day. We'd go to the different islands to go for hikes. We'd go to different spots to go snorkeling. And then we'd go to other times, we'd just jump in and go along the shore in the zodiacs to look at the wildlife uh, on the sides, on the shorelines. So very neat all day long to be jumping into these little boats on different islands and going to explore in lots of different ways. The food on the National Geographic Endeavor was incredible. The crew was awesome. And then there were eight or nine naturalists who would go with us to the different islands to tell us about how they formed, the different animals that live there. And they were some of the, the smartest and um, most happy to share people that I've ever had the pleasure of hanging out with. And they're all from Ecuador, some right from the Galapagos, some from the mainland. So it was great to learn about the country from people who grew up there and live in the country and on the islands themselves. This is North Seymour. So North Seymour is a bird island. This island had all kinds of different bird species, uh, frigate birds, blue-footed boobies, um, different types of seagulls. And so the neat thing about the Galapagos is all the animals for millions of years um, evolved uh, without humans around, without seeing humans as predators. So we could walk around on the islands and the animals didn't run away. The birds, the lizards, the sea lions, you name it, they just kind of look at you and then they carry on their business. So you could be really close, take some really great pictures, and the animals just keep doing their normal behavior because they don't look at people as predators. So this is a blue-footed booby, and you can tell it gets the name from the feet. And then it has two chicks with it. So full-time job to keep those chicks fed. This is a male, and he's doing something right now. He's showing off his feet to a female. You can't see her because she's off to the side. But the bluer his feet are, it's a signal that he's eating really well. So the males with the bluest feet attract the most females because it's an indication that, yep, they can get lots of food, they're healthy, and they'd be good to raise a chick with. So he's doing part of his dance. He's showing her his feet to say, hey, look how healthy I am. I'm a good choice. And this is another part of the dance. They call it sky pointing. So the male, when he really thinks he has the female's attention, he raises his tail, raises his beak, and he calls out to, up to the sky. They call it sky pointing. So we watched this male and female for a while, and the male tried his hardest to show off and, and be impressive, but in the end she flew away. So I guess maybe his feet weren't blue enough or his dance wasn't impressive enough. The other birds that were showing off were the frigate birds. So this is a male, and normally this red pouch is just a, shriveled up like a balloon, like a tiny little balloon. But during mating season, when they want to show off to the females, they inflate their pouch, they fill it with air, and they wait till the females fly over and they shake and call and try to get their attention to say, hey, look at my pouch. I've got the best, the brightest pouch. I eat really well. I'd be a good choice to, uh, to raise chicks with. So sometimes two or three days they'll have these pouches inflated trying to get the female's attention. All right. Also on this island were land iguanas. And these guys are pretty cool. They have a territory that they protect and in their territory they have a prickly pear cactus and that's their source of food. So they protect that source of food from other iguanas and then from time to time they take a bite. So you can see this is his prickly pear cactus and you can see the little spots where he took these little cookie cutter bites from time to time. We moved to another island called Rabida and this was a really neat island. It, uh, the rock was very red and the volcanic rock was rich in iron. So over time, being exposed to the water and the oxygen, essentially these rocks rusted and giving this island a really rich red color. And that was the neat thing about all the islands in the Galapagos, is even though the whole stretch of islands is only maybe just over 100 miles, every single island was different. And if you really knew the area, you could be dropped on an island and know exactly where you were based on what the island looked like. So this is Rabida. We did some snorkeling. Um, it was infested with green sea turtles. So sometimes on a snorkel, you'd see 10 green sea turtles, 15, 20. On one snorkel, even 30 green sea turtles over the course of the swim. 
and they're all there for this stuff. This green algae on the rocks, they love it. The seagrass, the algae, it's a good source of food for them. So lots of food, lots of turtles. And there's another picture of one moving along the bottom. And this is a chocolate chip starfish. I think you can guess why it gets its name. It looks a little bit like a cookie covered in chocolate chips. So a chocolate chip starfish. Still on Rabida, these are some Galapagos mockingbirds. And it was really neat because we got off the zodiacs and these birds were running around chasing each other in amongst our feet. They didn't care that we were there and you could just bend down and take really nice pictures of them uh, doing their thing. So Galapagos mockingbirds. This is old lava flow, this black rock. And every island you could find these guys all over the black rocks, the Sally Lightfoot crabs. And if you looked really carefully, you could see them shooting little jets of water at each other when they annoyed each other, which was pretty neat to see. The marine iguanas are unique to anywhere in the world. Um, they're the only iguana species that can swim in the ocean. So when they are hungry, they crawl down to the ocean, they swim out a little ways and they dive down and they eat algae off of the rocks. After about 10, 15 minutes, they're getting pretty cold and tired. They come back and they lay on the rocks and warm up again. So we're gonna talk about these guys a little bit more in a second, but they're pretty unique to the world. Um, you don't find any other iguana species that can swim in the ocean and eat in the ocean. Here's another one enjoying the sun, probably after a swim, warming up. You can see he looks pretty happy. And then Fernandina, which was the youngest island, um, were hundreds and hundreds of marine iguanas on the shoreline. And the food was so rich this time of the year that the algae uh, that they like to eat was growing right up on the rocks. So some of them didn't even have to go for a swim. They could just crawl along the shore and they'd have a nice buffet set up for them. They didn't even have to go deep into the water. This is Fernandina as well. You can see the old lava flow, the black rock. Okay, at one point this was liquid rock, but uh, cooled and formed solid rock. Looking out here is the Endeavor. And then this in the background, this is the landscape of Isabella. You can see the volcanoes. There's one, there's another one uh, in between. So Fernandina, the youngest island, and then the biggest island, Isabella. These guys are great, the flightless cormorants. So normally cormorants can fly, but these guys who got to the island, um, after hundreds of thousands of years with no predators, they didn't really need the ability to fly anymore. The energy could be put somewhere else. So they have these tiny uh, underdeveloped wings, but these big strong back feet that they can use to swim through the water. And so this is a male coming back from hunting for fish and he's got a present for his mate, for the female. And apparently seaweed is a great present in the Galapagos because he brought it to the nest. He was proud as can be. You can see him here dropping it in front of the nest uh, for his mate. So here she is, and then there's two chicks that they're raising. And so he's gonna warm up now in the sun. You can see they've got these beautiful blue eyes. While he's warming up, she's getting ready to go herself to find some food, and then he'll feed the chicks, and they'll come back and switch again, and they'll do that throughout the day. We cross the equator. Uh, multiple times, but this was one time we crossed the equator at sunset. Um, this is the snout of Isabella. So Isabella, I showed you, was shaped like a seahorse. This is the snout at sunset. You can see, you can really see the volcanic features of the islands here. This was a hike on Isabella. Right here is the open ocean, and this is the Endeavour and we're up on the ridge of a parasitic volcano that grew off the side of another volcano. And you can see that the crater, or the cone, filled with fresh water. So we have fresh water here in the crater, and then this is the ocean here, outside. A big highlight was the Galapagos tortoises, and these guys can get pretty big. Um, this was on Isabella. You can see, if you just lay down on the ground quietly with your camera, you can see me up here you can get some really great pictures. So normally the rules in the park are you have to stay six feet away from the animals. But 
sometimes the animals come closer. So this guy, something got uh, his or her attention and that's the direction they wanted to go. So it started crawling towards me, getting closer, and then eventually I had to roll out of the way or I would have been run over in slow motion and they're not light. So this tortoise, uh, if I didn't roll out of the way, I bet would have crawled right over top of me like I wasn't even there. More land iguanas, so these guys here, um, just before I took this picture, there'd been a fight. So two males stumbled into each other's territory. First they tried to show which one was bigger. Then they tried bobbing their heads, and that didn't work. So then they actually did fight. So they weren't biting, but they were headbutting and pushing each other. And eventually uh, the bigger male pushed the other one enough that it decided this isn't good for me, and it left. This is um, Santiago now, and this is a Galapagos hawk. And these are the biggest predators on the Galapagos. So they'll hunt little lizards, they'll hunt young marine iguanas, and they're the biggest predators that belong in the Galapagos. Now, humans have introduced other species to the Galapagos, like dogs and cats, so obviously they're bigger predators, but naturally on the Galapagos, this uh, bird here is the king, the Galapagos hawk. This is some of the beach in Santiago, and that's the beautiful thing about the Galapagos. Um, not a lot of people live in the islands. In fact, there's only three areas in the archipelago of islands that have a little settlement. Um, other than that, it's all national park and protected. So miles and miles of these beautiful, pristine beaches. And in the evenings, green sea turtles will haul themselves up out of the water, the females. They'll crawl up, drag themselves slowly to the bushes. They'll dig a hole in the sand and they'll lay roughly 100 ping pong ball sized eggs, cover them back up and head to the ocean. And then later, when the little turtles hatch, they have to crawl back to the ocean to start their life in the ocean. Monsieur? Here we have another view from Santiago. You can see a lagoon here just behind the ocean and then a view out over um, the Endeavor. I really like this picture. We were waiting for the Zodiacs to get back onto the boat um, to bring us back for some breakfast. This is an early morning hike and this beautiful rainbow formed. It looked like it was coming out right from the stern of the Endeavour and stretching across the sky. So pretty cool picture. This picture I like to include because there's a lesson here. They have a little glass bottom boat on the Endeavour and uh, it's for the people who don't like to snorkel. They're not comfortable in the water so they can go on the glass bottom boat. And I love to snorkel, I love to scuba dive, I love to be in the ocean. So I thought I'd show off and wave to the people underneath the glass bottom boat. So I was doing that a few times. Everything was going great, but then there was a little chunk of the reef, of the rock, that was sticking out that I didn't see, and I hit my shoulder on it. So not a big deal, but that's what you get for showing off, I guess. And the ship's doctor just cleaned it up, no big deal. We're still on Santiago, and these are lava lizards. So much smaller than the marine iguanas. And if you look at the two different ones, this is a male and this is a female. So she has much brighter coloration, which is kind of unusual because usually the male has the brighter colors to attract the female. And the female is usually a little drabber so she can camouflage and protect the young or the nest better. So in this case though, the male had a little more of a, of a laid back appearance where the female was really brightly colored with this orange streak in her yellow belly. The sea lions, these guys were so much fun. Um, obviously you could see them on the shore all the time. However, the snorkeling was where they were the most fun, especially the young ones. They like to tug on your flippers. They like to pop up in your face and blow bubbles. Uh, they like to do somersaults with you. So pretty much every snorkel in the Galapagos, you got to play with these young sea lions. And, you know, I've been in a lot of snorkels, a lot of uh, scuba dives. There's nothing like doing somersaults with a sea lion. It's a lot of fun. They're pretty fast. Sometimes, though, they disagree with each other. They get into little fights. Or sometimes you get to see awesome moments like this where the mother 
is feeding her pup, and this pup couldn't have been more than about a week old, maybe a little more, maybe a week and a half, and it's just having some milk um, at sunset, so it's a great scene to watch these two. Now, the marine iguanas, I said we talk about them again. So they come out of the water, but there's something, there's a trade-off to swimming in the ocean and eating out of the ocean, is there's a lot of salt in the plants. Too much salt to stay in their bodies. So they have a gland in their nose where the salt is removed from their bodies, and the only way to get it out is to sneeze the salt out of their bodies. So basically, after they get out of the ocean, while they're warming up, they sit around and they sneeze salt snot all over each other. And so I sat for a while to get this picture at the right time, but if you look, you can see the sneeze happening. Out comes the salt all over its buddies. So salty sneezes all day long to get the extra salt out of their bodies. This is Santa Cruz, so this is the Puerto Ayera. It's the biggest little settlement in the Galapagos, about 18,000 people. It's pretty unique. Not many places in the world, if you want to go to the bank, do you have to step over top of a sea lion sleeping on the front step. So pretty neat. They also had a fish, an area where the fishermen come in and clean their catch, and the sea lions were sitting on and behind the counters. The pelicans were all around sitting on the counters. It was really neat to see the animals really living in the parts of the city close to the shore. The Charles Darwin Research Station is on Santa Cruz, and here they do all kinds of conservation work. So on one hand, they try to protect the species that belong in the Galapagos. So the Galapagos is pretty unique. It has something called endemic species. So that means it's their species of animals found nowhere else in the world, just in the Galapagos. So Endemic means they're found in one place in the world. Um, so they're trying to protect species like these saddleback tortoises. You can see they're different from the tortoise I showed you earlier. They have this big saddle here to let their long necks reach up high to get plants uh, at a higher level. So the tortoises I showed you before, they couldn't reach plants high off the ground. They get them low, whereas these guys with the longer necks and the saddles can reach plants higher up so they can get a food source the other tortoises can't. So as well as protecting species that belong in the Galapagos, the research center is working hard to get rid of species that don't belong in the Galapagos. So we call those invasive species, in most cases brought by humans for different reasons, like rats, they got there by sneaking into ships and getting onto the islands. Um, bugs can get there that way as well. Species like dogs, cats, cattle, goats, they got there by humans who wanted a source of food, or sometimes they get off the boats. So there's lots of different ways that invasive species can get onto islands. So they're protecting the species that belong there, and they're looking for ways to get rid of the species that don't. So a good example is the mangrove finches. So mangrove finches, uh, there's only about 40 left, 20 breeding pairs in the world, 40 birds. And the problem is there's a species of fly invasive fly that doesn't belong there. The flies eat the skin of the little baby birds and they don't survive, they don't make it to be adults. So there's a big project right now to breed the mangrove finches in captivity, so raise them by hand and then release them back into the wild and at the same time they're working really hard to wipe out that one species of fly. So you can imagine how tough that is getting rid of one fly, but not hurting all the flies that belong there. So it's a big, big project. We went into the highlands of Santa Cruz, which were higher in the, in the, on the side of the volcano. So they were uh, a wetter area, so much more green. And we could watch the giant tortoises eating in the fields. So all over the place were these big lumps of these giant tortoises eating and doing their thing in the fields. I like this picture. This is a little lagoon and you can see how big they are. This is a duck, okay? Ducks are pretty big. Look how small this duck is compared to this tortoise. It's about the size of its back leg, really. They're pretty big, and they get bigger than this guy. So this is probably maybe a medium 
to large, medium-sized tortoise, they can get bigger on some of the islands. Here's another one. Having an eat, you can see how green it is compared to other parts that we visited. This is the final island, San Cristobal. You can see the different landscape. We are kind of hiking through the foothills, the volcanic foothills. You can see the little beach where we started from and then hiked up. You can see some of the terrain as we made our way over the rocks. This is a unique island because it's the only island where all three species of booby uh, breed. So there's the blue-footed booby I showed you already. This is a Nazca booby. And this is a red-footed booby. So all three species can be found on this island. And then they're harassed by these guys. This is a frigate bird. You can see its pouch isn't inflated. And they're called the pirates of the sky because they don't actually get their own fish. They bug other birds, like the blue-footed booby, until they regurgitate or throw up the fish they just caught. And then they eat that fish. So they're lazy. They don't like to hunt on their own. They'd rather steal from others. You can see it's bugging these two birds. This is the adult. This is the young one. It's trying to get them to give up their fish, to regurgitate their fish so it can eat. And this went on for quite some time. You can see this battle here. We watched for probably about 20 minutes, and eventually the frigate bird gave up. Uh, these guys were too tough. They weren't going to give up their breakfast. Another view. This is the furthest east point in the Galapagos. You can see the National Geographic Endeavor in the background. We spent our last bit of time in the Galapagos on another beach in San Cristobal. You can see the beautiful blue water. All these lumps are sea lions here. You can see all these black lumps. They're sea lions just enjoying a nice lounge on the beach, just like people like to do. And we watched the pelicans, the pelicans diving for fish, which was pretty cool to try and catch these pictures while they were diving. All right, that brings us to the end of the pictures I want to share today. But I'm going to quickly share two videos. So um, sometimes they come through really well, sometimes they don't. You'll have to let me know. But you can check them out on your own on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube page if you want to see them later. But this first one is what it's like to swim with a Galapagos sea lion. So I'm going to fast forward just a little bit to where it's really doing some good diving for me. So I hope that played okay, but if it didn't, uh, your teachers can check it out uh, with you on our YouTube page, so Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants on YouTube. And I love this video here. Let me just call it up. So I had a 360 camera with me, so I could take 360-degree pictures and videos. Now I set it up to get a marine iguana walking by, but the camera fell over, so I thought the shot was ruined. But look what actually happened when the camera did fall over. The marine iguana came right over and crawled over top, licked the lens a couple times, and moved on. So you'll want to check this out with your teachers because uh, if they use Firefox to open it, you can control the whole 360. You can move it around and, and look at the whole video. Um, so definitely check that out later today. But for now, I'm going to pop back in, and I'm going to talk to the classrooms, because I would love to steal some of your questions. So I should be back now. Let's jump to Freehold, New Jersey. We've got a grade four class joining us, Mrs. Wilson's group. Uh, your microphone is on if you have some questions. Um, yes, we have a couple. This is Abby. <laughs> Hi, Abby. 
What was your favorite island and why? Okay. Um, easy question. It was Fernandina. Fernandina is the youngest island. Um, it, it was more protected than some of the other islands because it didn't have fresh water on it. So hundreds of years ago when sailors were coming to the islands and uh, for water or to take food off like the giant tortoises, um, they didn't really stick around Fernandina because there wasn't a source of fresh water. And in that way, it got to be a little better protected uh, than some of the other islands. And I'll paint a picture for you. I always think of this when I'm on Fernandina, standing on the old lava rocks, um, surrounded by hundreds of marine iguanas, looking out at Isabella with all its vol volcanoes, um, sea lions resting on the shore, looking at the water, probably about 12 uh, sea turtles floating on the surface, uh, just having a breath of fresh air, the marine iguanas swimming back and forth as they went out to eat, um, just an incredible island, so much life. There were two Galapagos hawks sitting in the tree next to me. So uh, that was by far my favorite island in the Galapagos. They were all pretty awesome, but Fernandina was pretty special. Thank you. We have one more question. Let's see. Um, what are some ways that they tried to get rid of the invasive species? Okay. Awesome question. Awesome. Um, so lots of different ways. So on Isabella, it used to be the majority of the island was infested by goats, and the goats would eat the food um, that was available for the, the tortoises. So um, they tried lots of things, um, hunting them from the air, um, putting goats down with strong hormones, so it attracted all the goats in the area, and then they could, they could take them and remove them from the islands. So that's how they tried to get rid of the goats. Um, there's species of wasps that they're trying to get rid of. So they're using different mixtures to try and attract just the one species uh, and capture them and leave the other ones uh, alone. Um, the flies that I talked about, they're breeding them in captivity right now at the research center and they're trying different things on them to see what will hurt them but won't hurt um, the other insect species that belong there. Um, invasive plants are on the island, so they're looking around and removing those, uprooting those, and planting species that belong. So there's lots of different little programs that they're using to try and get rid of the species that don't belong um, and keep the ones that do. The rats, uh, Rabida, that red island that I showed you, they got rid of all the rats, but they had to catch all the hawks first and keep them off the island for a few days Well, they poisoned all the rats because if the hawks ate a poison rat, it would kill them. So lots of things to think about when they're trying to uh, clear these islands off. So great questions. I'm gonna jump to Mrs. Wowchuck's class in Thunder Bay, because I know they have to leave soon. Um, they are joining us, uh, they're a grade five, six class. So go ahead with a couple questions. Do the animals move island to island? Mm, good question. Um, so it depends on what animal it is. Um, some of them do. Some of the birds obviously can fly uh, back and forth from island to island. Um, some of the marine iguanas, if the islands are pretty close, could get from island to island. Um, but the really unique thing about the Galapagos is even though these islands are relatively close together, some of them, it's still enough distance that most don't travel from island to island. So years and years ago, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years ago, even maybe millions, um, there'd be storms in Peru and Ecuador. It would knock a bunch of leaves and palm trees and trunks into the water, and those would form rafts. So lizards, tortoises, and other animals would be swept out into the ocean. They'd climb on these rafts, and they drift all the way to the Galapagos and end up on different islands. So something like the marine iguana could drift to an island as a normal land iguana, change over time, but since the islands are separate from each other, the same species of iguana gave rise to different species on each island. So it's actually pretty cool. It's a great laboratory for scientists who are studying evolution and what happens on islands when they're isolated from each other. So I hope that helped with your question. What was the most interesting animal that you 
you saw. Hmm. Um, well, that's a tough one. I, there were so many that I wanted to see and so many that I got to see. I think one of my favorite moments was uh, snorkeling with the flightless cormorants. So getting to watch them dive down, catch fish underneath the rocks, bring them back up. That was a ton of fun. And then I don't think any trip to the Galapagos is complete without seeing the giant tortoises. So it was really neat to see them in the wild on two different islands on Santa Cruz and then to see them uh, on Isabella. And then it was really neat to see the difference in the species. So I showed you the ones on Isabella that kind of had the dome shells and their short necks. So they only ate food that they could get on the ground. And then I showed you those long neck ones, the saddlebacks um, that were at the research center. And so they are adapted to a different lifestyle where they have to reach food that's higher off the ground. So the tortoises, I think, were the most interesting to see the different uh, species of tortoises. So thank you for the questions. I know you have to duck out soon. So thanks for hanging out today. Um, Mrs. Sincotta's class is in New York. They're a grade four class. I'll turn your microphone on. So Jessica, go ahead. How can rocks rust? Okay, that's a good question. So it's not the rock itself, it's the iron that's found in the rocks. So iron makes up a lot of things that we, ha that we have um, that you can probably find around uh, metal things. So when iron is exposed to water and oxygen over time, there's a chemical reaction and you get that rust forming on top of the metal. And that's essentially what's happened on Rabada. So these volcanic rocks were very rich in iron. They've been exposed to the elements for a long, long periods of time. And slowly over time, there are, these rocks have essentially rusted. The iron in the rocks has reacted um, and the red deposit is formed. So it's a rusting island, which is pretty cool to see. Um, and the sand was the same way. So these beautiful red sand beaches, I didn't show you the picture. So this, the beaches were red and then the sea lions were laying on it and we saw one sea lion with a big shark bite out of it. So obviously when it was younger, it was bitten by a shark. Um, it survived and it healed. So that was kind of neat to see um, a sea lion that had survived a shark attack. Go, go ahead if you have another one. Um, how many species are there on all of the islands? Oh man, that's a really good question. Um, and to be completely honest, I don't know the total number of species uh, in the Galapagos. Um, what I can tell you is that compared to other places, um, it's not quite as biodiverse, which means there's not quite as many species because they're volcanic islands. So when they originally formed, they would have just been lifeless rocks to start. And then seeds that were able to drift, um, you know, on the air for a thousand miles uh, would land on the islands and start to grow. Um, also plants that drifted in those floating rafts that I told you about. Birds could obviously make it there. Some bird species could fly there. But the land species all had to get there from over a thousand miles away. And so only a few species, like certain lizard species, certain uh, the iguana, um, made the tortoise made it there by floating uh, on these giant rafts. So that in itself means that not as many species are going to get there. Now over hundreds of thousands of years, um, one species can diverge into other species, which is what happened in the Galapagos, but it's still not as rich as somewhere like the mainland, like Ecuador or Peru, where you have the rainforest and you have thousands of different species. So. Um, cool species in the Galapagos found nowhere else in the world, but it's not a place that would be rated very high in biodiversity. All right, so great questions from New York, and we'll visit our last class in Smooth Rock Falls. They are a group of classrooms. I believe there's some students from kind of the grade three to six range joining us. I'll just turn your microphone on and go ahead with some questions. Are there any active volcanoes there? All right, very good question. Um, in the west, so those younger islands, Isabella, Santiago, 
and um, Fernandina, there is some volcanic activity. So as the islands move further from the hot spot, they go dormant. So Espanola, um, San Cristobal in the east are not still active, whereas the ones to the west are. And not too long ago, just last year actually, Wolf Volcano, one of the volcanoes on Isabella, erupted. And some really lucky people on the National Geographic Endeavor were able to um, see it and to take some pictures. So they diverted the ship so that people could see this, you know, for some people, a once in a lifetime opportunity to see a volcano erupting with the, with the lava making its way down to the ocean. So um, the islands are still changing and growing. The younger islands, um, anytime there's lava flow, they grow because the rock cools when it reaches the ocean um, and the island gets a little bit bigger. So yeah, there are still, there's still uh, active volcanoes in the Galapagos. Can we ask another question? Absolutely. Do you have any plans to go back? <laughs> I would absolutely love to go back to the Galapagos. Um, 10 days was amazing. And we got to visit eight or nine islands, which was pretty spectacular because they are tough to get to. They're, you know, there's two little airports in the Galapagos. And other than that, uh, there's no other airstrips. Um, you get to the islands on boats. Um, there's no big cities. I told you there's three little settlements, uh, one on Isabella, one on Santa Cruz. And I think, yeah, the other one's San Cristobal. Um, but other than that, you get around uh, on boats. And so we, we, we did most of the western uh, part of the islands. I'd love to come back and do some of the eastern islands. And then I mentioned that I love to scuba dive. So further to the north are two little islands. One's called Wolf, one's called Darwin. Um, not very big, uninhabited, but some of the best hammerhead shark diving in the world. So um, they just protected the area. It's a protected marine environment now. Uh, you go at the right time of the year and sink down to the bottom and you can watch hundreds of hammerhead sharks swim over top of you. Big, big groups of hammerhead sharks. So I would love to go back and live on a dive boat. They call them liveaboards. So live on a dive boat for a week and dive four or five times every day on different spots, especially to see those hammerhead sharks. I'd love to do that. And I should mention that the government of Ecuador is doing an awesome job protecting the Galapagos. Um, they limit the amount of tourists, so about 200,000 people visit the Galapagos a year. You can't be in groups on the island bigger than 16, so every group of 16 needs a naturalist and has to be separate. Um, there's clearly marked paths you can't leave. You can only be on the islands from 6 in the morning till 6 at night. They know all the boats that are allowed to be there and they have GPS trackers on them and they guide them to different spots. So they say, okay, this is the islands you can visit during this week. This is the islands you can visit. So over the, the eight days we were on board the ship, we rarely saw any other boats because they were all in different spots to lessen the impact of humans on the islands. So, they are doing a really good job, lots of good conservation money um, to try and protect the Galapagos. So they really are a model that other countries could use um, to protect their resources and still make money. So you could overfish, you could cut down trees and that year make some good money. But in the long run, you don't make a lot of money that way, you don't support a lot of people. By protecting areas, bringing in tourists and giving people good jobs, the areas are protected and people can still make a living. So it's called ecotourism and they're doing a really good job of that right now in the Galapagos. All right, so um, I said we'd be about 40, 45 minutes. I want to thank everybody for hanging out with us today. Um, I hope you guys learned a little bit about the Galapagos. I hope you'd like to go and check it out in the future. Um, if you have any more questions, please feel free. Your teacher can email me some more questions and I will answer them. Check out our YouTube page, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and you'll find three cool videos up right now. There's the sea lions, there's the 360 image of the iguanas, and then there's a 360 video 
where myself and another teacher are up in the crow's nest of the ship and we're crossing the equator at sunset. So it's a pretty cool little video. You can see 360, but use Firefox to check those out and then you can turn the whole picture and look around during the videos. Um, what I'd like to do now is turn on the microphones, let the classes say goodbye, and then uh, we'll sign off for today. So the microphones are coming on. Thank you so much, everybody. It was great to hang out with your classroom. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, and hopefully I see your classes again soon, meeting other scientists, adventurers, and conservationists on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Have a good afternoon, everyone.